a squashed owl production. Hello, this is Ryan again with the Clive Barker Podcast, bringing you the next in our series of Kickstarter stretch goals. Uh, we've got another video game review for you. Uh, this time it's Clive Barker's Jericho. Uh, created by Codemasters and an original story by Clive Barker, this is a creepy semi-survival first-person shooter game. More Clive Barker fans likely have this game for Windows. At least during the book signing in 2007 uh, for Mr. B Gone, most people I saw online had Windows copies. I bought my first Xbox 360 because Clive Barker's Demonic was just around the corner. Of course that game was cancelled, but we got a game that's likely much better. Xbox One does not support Clive Barker's Jericho. Uh, likely because it seems like the strategy they have for backwards compatibility is to uh, work on games that get people excited for new games. Like if somebody wants to play Halo 3 before they play Halo 20 or whatever. Uh, so with Jericho unfortunately being a one-off story, its final resting place may be this 2007 release. Uh, Windows, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3. It was recently removed from the Steam store, unfortunately. Fans of Weave World may recognize the setting where our heroes, the Jericho Squad, are sent. Uh, the Empty Quarter. In Weave World, it's the site of Old Eden. And in this game, also a place where energy from the Firstborn, a creature God created before man, infects our world, and our team is here to seal the breach. Fascinating. The mural's Sumerian, but the writing's Aramaic. Ancient when this tatters. game came out, I no, got totally games. engrossed in it. It's one of the only, only a couple of games that I ever got every single achievement and played through on every difficulty. So, please forgive me if I'm a little rusty this time around for this review that was nine years ago. As you begin the game, you're in this preacher character, Devin Ross, who, spoiler, gets killed in the first 60 minutes of the game. So how's that for a kick in the face? But as Jose likes to mention on our podcast, uh, Clive Barker characters are never really dead, so Ross becomes a kind of a parasitic ghost who inhabits uh, the fellow members of the Jericho Squad, one at a time. So while you're in one squad member, the others are non-playable and sometimes annoying. They like to walk in front of you in a firefight. You got me into this. I'm counting on you to get me out. Uh, in time, they all give you permission to possess them. If you need my blood magic, you can link to me when you need to. Just don't screw up, or you'll have to deal with Frank. Having seven characters on the screen at once is a little bit of a chaotic nightmare, and they don't really feel like a well-trained, well-honed team. They get killed constantly, so you spend a lot of time resurrecting team members. Uh, because uh, when they all die, you get sent back to the title screen, where you have to restart from the last checkpoint at the beginning of the level. As the ghost of Ross, even though you're dead, you can still give orders. So I went through the tutorial on how to do this, and then I promptly forgot about it until I got to the first of the, these puzzles. There are actually two. Uh, these feel a little tacked on. You basically are telling people, you stand on this pressure plate. You know, Alpha Team, stand on this pressure plate, or whatever. And in reality, they would have just said, hey, can everybody stand on one of these? Uh, so it's a little more complicated than it need to be, and it feels a little tacked on, and for me it stopped the pace of this action horror game. Move out. Another thing that sort of detracts from the horror and suspense of this game is are these little quick time events. Uh, so maybe some people get these right on the first attempt, but I get my guy killed over and over again until I've practiced enough to make it all the way through. Uh. 
So let's talk about the different characters. Uh, the first one is Frank Delgado, who's a pyromancer. Yeah, he made a deal with a fire spirit, so he's got one trapped in his arm with a stone enclosure around it, uh, which can be opened to unleash the fire spirit on his enemies. Uh, the, the, these characters typically have a main weapon, a secondary weapon, and their special weapon. So for Frank Delgado, his main weapon is a minigun. And in this game, you learn quickly that the enemies can absorb an enormous amount of bullets unless you hit them in the head. So this high-speed weapon is pretty good at taking down most enemies. Uh, his second, secondary weapon is a handgun. And for some inexplicable reason, uh, whenever Cole magically brings in more ammo, she always forgets to get you more for your secondary weapon. Uh, so this weapon is lame to start with, and then when you run out of bullets, you don't get more until the next level. Uh, the fire spirit, Ababanili, is awesome. Uh, it flies around wherever you point your arm, and catching enemies on fire. Billy Church, she's a blood ward, so she does kind of blood magic. Uh, Billy's primary weapon is a one-handed automatic pistol, uh, like an Uzi, which does fine, but it runs out of bullets really fast. Her secondary weapon is a katana, which is great and makes her semi-indestructible when it's used in combination with her blood ward, which captures enemies and holds them in place, and then she kind of instant kills them with the, with the sword. And lastly, she has a fire ward that sets fire to anything uh, nearby, which is kind of useful. I only used it this one time. Xavier Jones is a seer, so he's a likable character, but his main function seems to be having out-of-body experiences and pulling levers or pushing buttons. You Yanks aren't very subtle, are you? Every Jerry from miles around is going to come running now. Uh, he has a machine gun that doubles as a shotgun, but his weapons really aren't that impressive, and you find yourself not really wanting to stay with him. Paul Rawlings, or Father Rawlings, is an exorcist. Uh, his two hand gu guns can be customized to fire different Rawlings, kinds of rounds. But I didn't experiment with this much. I mean, it, di it didn't really feel like it made any kind of difference what kind of rounds he was firing. The, g the enemy still, you know, died in the same amount of time. He's not that fun to play. And he gets killed easily. And he's the only other guy that can resurrect teammates. So it didn't make sense to stay with him. Because if you're in somebody else, then you have two people that can resurrect your dead friends, but if you're inside of him, then there's only one. Uh, his, so his special ability is that he can resurrect allies at a long distance, which is kind of cool, but I never really got used to doing that because I didn't want to be in him. Uh, and then he's got some, this bizarre curse that's supposed to make your allies heal when, you, when they shoot the cursed enemy. Uh, but to me, this is extraneous nonsense, and the application of this skill effectively has you waving your hands around in the air, uh, begging these rabid zombies to murder you. And then you have Abigail Black, who's a telekinetic. So she has this fun skill where, kind of like, if you remember that movie Wanted with Angelina Jolie, uh, uh, she can guide her sniper bullet to the target. So, and even better than that, she can also guide it through more than one enemy. So you can curve it around so it goes through one guy, then goes through another one. Uh, sometimes you can even kill three in a row. Uh, she has a, also has a telekinetic push uh, that knocks down boulders and locked doors and stuff like that. So sometimes they're like, hey, get over here and open this door. Um, but when she uses it, uses it against enemies, she sets them on fire. Black's secondary weapon is a very powerful grenade launcher. So when I, while I was trying to shoot all the yellow pustules off of these exploding guys like a chump, I discovered 
with Abigail, you can take these guys out with one shot of her grenade launcher. Simone Cole is called a reality hacker. So where every other character in this game controls spiritual or mystic forces, she seems to have like a savant's understanding of reality and in conjunction with a custom computer she can hack it. Uh, slow down time and download ammo for her team. Ammo resupply in progress. But uh, Cole can slow down time and sneak around enemies, which comes in handy in this section of the game where she's supposed to sneak around these World War II bunkers and throw a grenade into the back of them. But I never really used her after that. The bosses and the battles with them are pretty epic. I mean, check out these giant creatures with masks. And these are just regular enemies. Uh, the boss fights are sometimes a bit of a puzzle. Like with this guy, nobody tells you that you have to shoot the four bodies on the walls. Then shoot the hanging guy up there, and then when he dies, the shield drops down from the main guy. Um, so yeah, it's complicated, and most bosses have waves of minion enemies too that are hitting you when you're trying to aim at something else. Uh, and you only have a quick flash of time when an enemy is vulnerable. So while the mechanics of these bosses are pretty typical video game fare, um, they're unique to this game in their grotesqueness. So check out this hanging guy Jesus. who rips his stomach open to spray blood all over. So now let's talk about the atmosphere. Uh, the visual style is amazing. You feel the hopelessness as the characters seem to go further and further into the past. Uh, literally wading through blood as they go. Fighting hordes of demons, getting separated, uh, as the enemies die, their bodies are eerily carried away by flies, and you, if you're close enough, the buzzing can be a little unnerving in its uh, creepiness. The voice acting is good in parts, and a little annoying sometimes, too. Uh, while my first time playing through this game, I didn't mind the opening narrator, he comes across as cheesy this time around. The world as we know it does not exist without struggle. Our civilization is under constant assault from forces we would once have called the powers of hell. In truth, these forces are far more ancient than Christianity. More ancient than any religion that has left its trace upon our species' soul. It is evil incarnate, and it has been working to destroy our highest aspirations, our faith in love and light, since we came into being. But we do not dare name this evil. To do so would be to admit to its presence in our world. To acknowledge that its servants walk the same streets that we walk, and its overlords, depraved, corrupt, and hungry for our flesh and our destruction, are hidden in the empty wastes of our planet, awaiting the day of mankind's execution. Only one power stands between us and universal death. Warrior magicians who have dedicated their lives to our protection. Most of us will never know their names, nor the battlefields where they wage their secret wars, nor will we ever honor their dead. But they are with us, always. Armed, vigilant, and ready to die for another tomorrow. Jericho. They are called Jericho. They know all too well what the enemy is capable of. That before our species perishes, we will be tortured into madness, devoured alive. And they will do all in their power to protect us from such atrocities. If the world exists tomorrow, now you know why. Jericho. What's this game called again? Oh yeah, Jericho. Okay, so anyway, the other thing that kind of bugged me um, playing this game are these super long loading screens. It's like uh, somebody's typing out these um, these mission dossier things in on a typewriter, and whatever secretary is doing this obviously lied 
on his or her resume um, about their typing speed because this is super slow. Uh, it reminds me of, of um, I have a friend that uh, used to run a, a bulletin board system, Spiftum, and uh, there was we'd be hanging out at his house once in a while, and this was on an Apple II GS, and every once in a while uh, there would be this guy, Buzzbox, that would log on with a 300 baud modem. And he would type so slowly that it would take like 10 minutes to write one sentence. So we would, some, this is kind of mean, but we would, <laughs> we would sometimes push the disconnect button when he was just about to finally finish a paragraph after like 15, 20 minutes. Um, but <laughs> I guess that's sort of proto-cyberbullying. And, and I'm sorry, Buzzbox, we were high school kids. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Um, these things kind of bug me. I would assume that it's not like this in the PC version because it probably mostly loads off of the hard drive. The score for this game is cinematic, at times epic, and other times sad and melodic. Uh, did you know you can buy this score on iTunes? I, I bought it, and if you like it, please do the same and support the artist. So you may not be able to buy a new copy of this game anymore, but you can definitely get the soundtrack. I got a chance to talk with the composer uh, Chris Velasco about the musical score and working with Clive Barker and the developers of Jericho. It's, it's, it's wonderful to have you because uh, we, we've been playing um, Clive Barker's Jericho. In fact, Ryan has been doing a video review about the game. And, uh, and one of the things that we came up with was it would be great to be able to talk to the uh, to the soundtrack composer. So here we are. Yeah, thanks. It was, it was you know, it was the first time I worked with Clive, so really special project for me. So how did that come about? Uh, well, man, there's a real long story of how I <laughs> Clive, and that's how it all initially came about. But I don't know if you want to hear the whole story or just about um, the game. Uh, oh, sure. Whatever you're, yeah, this is, this is kind of a casual conversation. So, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. Um, so I grew up as a, as a, just a big fan of Clive and uh, I used to collect a lot of books and I would go to book signings. So I, I met him, you know, first at a book signing and this is before I even started studying music. Um, and then and then once I got into to music and composing, I was still going to these Clive Barker signings. And I started sending him, handing him, I should say, um, like a demo CD. And, you know, I, I hate to think what was on them now and what I was <laughs> <laughs> what I was leading with for Clive, but I'm sure it wasn't very good. Uh, but he was always just very, like, genuine and encouraging and... I'd give him a CD and I'd say, you know, Clive, one day we're going to work together. And uh, yeah, he was, he said, all right, I hope we do. And um, and so every every year or two or whenever he'd have a new book come out and he'd do a signing for it, I'd show up again with an updated CD <laughs> and did this about three times. And then one day in my, uh, this old apartment I was living in, um, I get a, a phone call and it says, you know, blocked caller. And, you know, I'm thinking like, oh God, it's, you know, someone trying to sell me something or, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and I almost didn't pick it up, but I, I clicked it over and, you know, you've heard Clive's voice, you know, he's got a very distinct gravelly. Oh yeah. Yeah. You, you, you couldn't not know it was Clive if you heard him say something. Um, so I pick up the phone, I say hello, and I hear that voice say, is this Chris Velasco? And uh, I instantly knew who it was. And I, I mean, I almost like, my legs almost buckled. <laughs> oh man, that is awesome. <laughs> and it yeah. says, you know, Chris, you've been talking about wanting to work with me for a number of years now. And, and I've, I've got the new video game and I know you work in games now. And, and I thought you'd be a perfect fit. So, you know, are you available and would you like to, to score my game. And that one was actually demonic. Oh yeah. I was going to ask about that. Um, and yeah, it was like best day of my life. I couldn't believe I went from, you know, like fanboy to now 
working with Clive Barker. Wow. And so that was, uh, I believe that was the first time I went to his house. He, he called me over. He said, let's, you know, let's chat about the project, listen to some music. I'll give you my thoughts. And, and so I went over to his house down into his, his workshop, his big painting room. And, and he was working on, I don't know, a number of like large canvases all at once. And he kind of had his, you know, his clothes were all spattered with paint and uh, he's chewing on a cigar. And, uh, and he, you know, he says, hey, Chris, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm, I want to keep painting. And, uh, and then he started pulling CDs out and playing them and, and painting something that was, you know, possibly for Aberat. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we just listened to music and talked about the project and it, it was crazy. So that, that would have been a really cool game had it ever come out. <laughs> did, did you ever get a chance to do any of the music for Demonic or does that always come near the end? No, I never wrote a, a single note for it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know that I, the, the demos that we've seen don't have any, any kind of musical score yet. Yeah. Or yeah, the footage, they, I guess. Yeah, they just um, they canceled the game internally without telling Clive, and and we, you know we were having meetings at his house for three days, and they were just they're too chicken to say from day one. The oh game man, was, we're here to tell you it's canceled. They made Clive sit through you know four hour meetings about about this game, and he's getting all worked up, and he's he's got this big tablet of paper out, he's he's drawing these ideas and. And he's ripping them up and like crumpling them. And I was like, "Oh, I'll take that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and then yeah, third day they were wrapping up another like four hour meeting, and Clive was like, "All right, gentlemen, I got to get back to work. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about this game. Like, you know, I'm I'm really pumped. I've been wanting to do another game for so long." And and that's when one of them finally was like, "Uh, the game's not happening." Oh my god! Oh my gosh! And just totally screwed up like i couldn't believe it it felt for me and i'd only been on the project for three days i felt like i just got kicked in the gut um right. this was, you know gonna be my dream project but man i can't even imagine uh how pissed clive must have been holy cow yeah i, I bought an xbox 360 for that game and <laughs> i kept on every day going to the website looking for updates and it just wouldn't say anything they, I don't think I don't remember ever a time when they said it was canceled. It just kept on going and going, and, and there was no news. And you know yeah. what's funny is that the only footage that we can see of that game demo is in the background in a TV in the movie Gram Grandma's Boy. Yeah, that someone is playing demonic on on yeah. one of the TVs. Yeah, I a friend of mine was like an extra or something in that movie, and he wanted to go see it. And like, oh, man, it doesn't look very good. But like, <laughs> and then they played some of, I didn't know that Demonic was in it. And and I saw it, and that's right when I was supposed to be working on it, you know, and I was kind of like sat up my seat like, oh, my God, it's Demonic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think in the movie they were playing it on an original Xbox, which doesn't really make any sense. But That's fantastic. But for Jericho, you actually got to work with a choir of about 30 voices. Uh, I think you recorded it at Skywalker sound uh yeah it's true yeah uh you work with leslie ann jones a multi-grammy award-winning engineer how, how was that experience like uh leslie is awesome i've actually recorded maybe like eight or nine times up there oh wow um yeah leslie is one of the the coolest people i know she's she's great she's a great person and she's a great engineer of course amazing uh, did you get to see any gameplay of the game, uh, Jericho, as you were composing, or were you just given concept art? Um, no, I could actually play the game because um, it was so late in the process. Mm -hmm. I actually it replaced another composer on this game. Oh, we did the whole long. How did I get on board, Jericho? But um, when I did, it was because. Clive again had personally hired me to score this game, and uh, and then the company that was making it decided that they didn't want me and they were going to use somebody else and just not tell Clive. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> and then at the very end of production, they um, the game developers had a meeting at, at Clive's house, 
to go over it and see what he thought of the game. Are there any changes you want to make before it's, you know, too late? And, and he made, he had some notes and then he said, and, but what is this, you know, what is this music I'm listening to? He said, Oh, well, that's the score. And he said, this is what Chris Velasco wrote. And, um, and they said, well, we didn't hire Chris. We <laughs> no. <laughs> this meeting, but I know two people that were, and they both uh, said that, that Clive like flew into a rage <laughs> oh, and, they, and told them that if they didn't call me and if I wasn't hired to rescore the whole game in the next 48 hours, he was taking his name off the project. Oh, oh wow. Um, yeah. Um, so that is the one and only time I've had my own, you know, 800 pound gorilla in the room. Yeah. Oh, that must be, that must be something to have a Clive Barker for a champion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's why, well, that's why I only had three weeks to score the whole game. Oh. Um, Is it typical, and, though, that you get to play the game while you're, you know, to while you're coming up with the score, or do you usually have to kind of use your imagination and look at concept art? Yeah, the, the latter. Okay. I, I rarely game. Well, it seems um, like it shows, because the, the, the music really kind of flows well with the game. Um, well... Yeah, that's that's the idea, and then hopefully we've I've uh, written it in a way that that the, can be easily implemented to actually do that. Uh, half the work is, you know, the audio engineer um, implementing the the score so that it, it makes the game feel seamless. Mm -hmm. What sort of notes did Clive give to you when you were composing Jericho? We just played. Uh, Again, had another listening session at his house, and he just played me a lot of music that he liked, and he and he told me a bit about the story, and he um, and we talked about how it had kind of religious connotations to it, and and so I thought, oh, but, you know, you got to have the choir singing in Latin if uh, mm. doing that, and and you know, with only a couple weeks or whatever to score the score, mix, and deliver the game. Um, there was really no time to have a, a recording session, but I just, I really wanted that choir. And when I, <laughs> I guess the company had been told, um, don't piss Clive off. Like just whatever Chris wants, just let him have it. <laughs> oh, that's cool. And I didn't do yeah. that until afterwards, uh, or I would have asked for a, a whole orchestra, but, but I asked if we could get the money to do a choir and, uh, yeah, they just like so quickly said, yes, that sounds great. Uh, oh, wow. So, yeah, I I actually started writing the, the whole score. We did this recording very soon in the process um, where I just recorded them doing a lot of long chords and a lot of kind of aleatoric, you know, weird clustery uh, stuff. And, and I did have a couple of melodies, so we recorded them doing that. Um, I had them re record some actual uh, Gregorian chants, and uh, then we just had them do weird effects and whispers and chanting. And um, so I got this whole big library of choir stuff, and then I used that as kind of the foundation to get started at writing. I really love the firstborn theme uh, because it opens with, uh, I believe it's Greek. It, it, it's just this little child's voice singing Kyrie Eleison, which means Lord have mercy, and it's just so creepy. It's just an excellent opening to the game. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if you've been playing it, you know that the firstborn... Oh, have you seen the firstborn yet? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we've yeah. seen it's several times. The old, I know yeah. that maybe I don't have to issue a spoiler alert. This no, video. no, it's okay. Uh, okay, so, you know, the firstborn was really, like, in the body of a child. Um, so I thought that would be cool to get a voice soprano um, to sing his theme. It works so well because it's just the singular voice, almost no instruments, and it's it, it goes towards the whole mythology of the firstborn because he was created first by God, and he was a soulless creature, and then God locked him away in by himself in a little dimension, and that's almost like him singing "Lord Have Mercy," and it's. Amazing, amazing opening for the game. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks. It, it also had the uh, the duality of my my wife's daughter is named Kyrie, and oh. I 
was, you know, how much younger back then, how many years it's been, but, uh, but brought her up to Skywalker too. And I, um, and so there was good scene. I was like, check it out. I put your name in, in Clive Barker's Jericho. And I thought, <laughs> That's great. That was awesome. And she was just kind of like, oh. <laughs> for jericho you released the jericho soundtrack or or someone released the jericho soundtrack on itunes so people can can buy it and download it is that normal or did, does, does that happen for other video game scores uh yeah i'd say most games are getting getting uh, itunes releases these days there's uh you know it's such a popular medium and and people really love the soundtracks now and I mean, there are concerts all over the world playing video game music. So, yeah, it kind of used to be few and far between for a, for a soundtrack to come out, but but now it's, it's pretty common. Yeah, especially on Bandcamp, you can see a lot of composers that do uh, soundtracks for indie computer games, yeah. um, you know, like, like The Binding of Isaac or other games like that. They usually end up for sale on websites like Bandcamp yeah. or iTunes. Right. So after Jericho, there was talk of a Jericho sequel, but then that all kind of sort of fizzled away. Was there, um, were you involved in that in any way, or was there any, did, had you heard anything more, more okay. than just what Clive Barker said in interviews? I think the game just didn't, just didn't sell well. Yeah. Um, I, a lot of people didn't care for it. I played it all the way through, and I actually thought it was a great game. I really liked it. I, I when I got done, I played it again on a higher difficulty, and then again on the last. So I I got all the thousand points on the Xbox 360. Yeah, so that that's going to be cool. Uh, we're going to put part of this interview on the uh, the video review that Ryan is doing because you've recorded the whole game through, and you're going to use that to make your video review. Yeah, yeah. All right. Wow, you've got a recording of you playing all the way through. Yeah, well, I'm not going to make people watch all of that, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of it was me falling asleep and like bumping my face into a wall over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you guys want to see Pinhead? Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Hold on. Um, can I turn the camera around on this? I don't think so. Is that is that the iPad? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. Oh, holy cow. That's amazing. Wait, so, let me you can see how huge it is. Oh my god. That's from the twenty fifth anniversary um Hellbound Heart. Uh yeah, they used that for the cover. Or twentieth anniversary, I think. Right? That from two thousand six. I am very mm -hmm. jealous. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's a really cool piece. Thank you so much for uh, giving us a peek of that amazing painting. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this by quoting what Clive Barker said about you once for Jericho. He said, It pleases me to no end to announce that once again, Chris Velasco will be providing the soundtrack to my worlds. Not only is Chris one of my favorite composers, he's one of my favorite people. His work on Jericho was unparalleled, and what he has brought to Books of Blood is, I assure you, nothing sort of astonishing. Prepare yourselves for an experience the likes of which you've never seen. This is what he said in 2014 when Made Fire's Book of Blood came out. That Clive, he's a nice guy. <laughs> he's awesome. Well, it's deserved, and we're looking forward to seeing more Clive Barker stuff with your uh, with your music. Yeah, cool. Thank you. I, I hope there will be. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, and thank you so much. I hope you had a good time on the Clive Barker podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. You too. That was cool. Uh, for the full interview, check out the Clive Barker Podcast, episode 127, or subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you can see the full video interview as well. Uh, as I said at the beginning of this, I was engrossed in the story, and uh, the connection with Weave World through the uh, Rube Al Khali and the Empty Quarter is a wonderful treat for Clive Barker fans. Other connections we can find, uh, the origin of the firstborn is reminiscent of the Neolithic from the novel Sacrament. And of course we have the Crusaders who hammered their own armor and weapons into their skin, uh, reminding us of course of the Cenobites from Hellraiser. We want the man who did this. So to summarize, 
Great game, awesome story, and it's fun to play mostly. Terrific classical score, and it has cool characters who sometimes get in your way. Occasionally annoying repetitive dialogue, but the narrator is totally awesome. Thanks for watching. You can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at OccupyMidian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, PocketCast, Google Play, and DoubleTwist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening. Jericho.